Hello YouTube, Science Biker here. Today I want to talk to you about the existence of atoms. Are you, do you know what an atom is? Are you familiar with the general concept of uh, matter, all matter being made up of atoms? Uh, and an atom consisting primarily of uh, protons, neutrons, and electrons? You've probably seen uh, pictures of a uh, simple Bohr model of an atom where protons and neutrons reside uh, in the center of the atom in what's known as the nucleus and electrons orbit in a cloud uh, planetary model outside the uh, outside the nucleus but can you prove that these atoms exist and how do you know that their structure is is the way it's uh, generally drawn. Well, today I want to very briefly touch that topic and, and just summarize a little bit of, of how we know matter is made up of atoms. And one of the simplest proofs for the existence of atoms uh, is known as Brownian motion. And what Brownian motion is, is it's the random movement of particles, small particles, which are suspended in a fluid. So, for example, um, if you drop small uh, particles of pollen into water and you observe them, um, especially under a microscope, you will see that the pollen moves around randomly and has a random uh, path that it will float through the water. And we know, due to Newton's second law, uh, well, all of his laws really, that well, force equals mass times acceleration is a second law, but, but that an object in motion has to stay in motion unless it's acted on by an outside force. Therefore, what causes these pollen particles to, to bounce around and, and wiggle randomly about in a uh, still glass of water? Well, the answer is, is Brownian motion, and, and Brownian motion being that, which, that motion which is caused by collisions from small atomic particles or, or molecules in the water. Um, you can see an easy example of this at home. Um, if you get two glasses of water, uh, one which is cold water and one which is relatively warm water, uh, and you take a drop of food coloring and you drop it, uh, one drop or two drops in each glass of the cold and the hot water, the cold water the, the food coloring will diffuse much, much sl slower in the cold water. Whereas in the hot water, uh, the food coloring will much more quickly reach the bottom and will be... Uh, this guy ahead of me is not driving very well. Uh, will, will, the food coloring will reach the bottom much quicker and it will also uh, become totally dissolved in the water much quicker. Well, why is that? Why does the food coloring dissolve so much more quickly in cold water? Well, the answer is that uh, the molecular motion of the water molecules uh, is it's much faster at, higher, uh, at warmer temperatures. So those random collisions of the water molecules with the food coloring molecules causes them to diffuse throughout the uh, water much faster when it is warm. And, but, but even if you just observe the cold water, you'll see that the food coloring kind of takes this random path where it kind of maybe wiggles its way down to the bottom of the glass and slowly diffuses. Well, what causes that random path? Well, that random path is Brownian motion. And it is due to the random, uh, cha ever-changing forces due to intermolecular collisions on, on the food coloring molecules. 
so this is a good simple proof to yourself that atoms exist. But around the time that uh, the, this whole Brownian motion concept was uh, first, you know, observed and, and really noted and studied, uh, the current concept at that time for an atom was what's known as a plum pudding model. And it was basically uh, theorized based on the fact that um, scientists had shown that matter was made of small particles uh, and they knew that uh, these small particles were neutrally charged overall but that they contained electrons. And so, therefore, if they contained electrons, then there must be some other part of the atom which is positively charged, which would offset the negative charge of the electron to, to yield a overall neutrally charged atom or molecule, particle, whatever you want to call it. Um, so, in that case, they basically drew up a, uh, a model of an atom where where uh, you had these electrons kind of suspended throughout the uh, rest of the atom as, as sort of raisins in uh, a plum pudding pie. So, on that note, Brownian motion was this first notated by a guy named Brown in the late 1800s, but it was actually Einstein that uh, describes the what was going on, that the motion was due to the mo movement of atoms within the fluid. And not too long after that, a guy named Rutherford came along Rutherford had discovered what he called alpha particles um, coming from radioactive isotopes, alpha and beta particles. And what an alpha particle is, is it's two protons and two neutrons, aka the nucleus of a helium atom. And uh, so Rutherford decides that he can use these alpha particles to probe what is uh, going on perhaps in atoms. So he takes a piece of gold foil and he pounds it into a very, very, very thin sheet. And then he uses a radioactive isotope to fire alpha particles at this gold foil. And then he basically creates a 360 degree uh, fluorescent film around the gold foil which fluoresces when uh, it's struck by alpha particles. Now if there were no interaction with the from the alpha particles which have a positive charge with the atoms, they would expect all the alpha particles to pass straight through the gold foil. Um, but what Rutherford actually observed is that the particles, the majority of them, did pass directly straight through uh, the, the, the foil. Uh, a certain percentage, small percentage, were diverted uh, somewhat off to the side, but a few were not just diverted uh, off to at some angle, but still passing through the foil. They actually bounced backward um, and uh, off at some angle, almost toward the uh, t t back toward the isotope. And uh, I'm not sure what's going on with this guy up here. So, what? So anyway, what Rutherford uh, basically 
theorized is, and correctly that an atom is 99% uh, empty space but that uh, if an alpha particle were to strike, be basically dead on with uh, the nucleus of the atom, the two positive charges would repel each other strongly enough that it would push the alpha particle back in the opposite direction. So that is what led to the general Bohr model of an atom where you've got a nucleus in the center of concentrated positive charge and electrons that are orbiting the nucleus uh, in, in uh, different orbital levels. And so that was uh, further expanded on by a scientist named Sommerfeld and became the Bohr-Sommerfeld model. And uh, basically said that uh, electrons, that these orbital levels can have different orientations and that uh, when an electron is promoted from one energy level to another, it uh, absorbs energy, or if, it, if, it, if an electron drops energy levels, that it gives off light. So, there's a problem, though, with this model. You've got electrons, which have a negative charge, orbiting a nucleus, which has a positive charge. And scientists didn't understand for many years how this was possible, they accepted it as it must be true because it uh, was consistent with their observations, but, but what ha should happen is if the uh, electron and the electron should be attracted to the positive charge and over eventually the electron should lose energy and decay into the nucleus and scientists couldn't explain why that didn't happen until uh, Schrodinger came along and basically uh, said that electrons orbited in the, 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 the orbits were an exact wave uh, uh, that there was that they had that the that electrons had a wave particle duality that they actually moved in waves and that the wavelength was an integer divisor of the uh, diameter of the orbit and you know the Bohr model also had said that waves may be spherical they may be elliptical or the orbits of the electrons could be spherical or elliptical and um, it established, uh, well, it's actually a different scientist, I'm blanking on his name, um, said that electrons also have spin, a positive or negative spin. Um, so anyway, this idea that an electron can behave both as a particle and a wave um, was good enough to establish that electrons could be stable in their orbit and not decay into the nucleus because of their wave-like behavior. So, anyway, oh, then I'll go one more step further and, and say that Heisenberg came along and basically uh, theorized that you could not know the speed and position of an electron and the atom at the same time. And this, you know, is basically what led to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that that if you knew with great precision the speed of an electron in the atom your uh, ability to know where it was located at that time was very low 
and that basically led to electron cloud probability models and uh, so you'd, you'd end up with a cloud and be able to say the probability that the electron is located somewhere in this area is so much and I think really that's all I really wanted to say for this video um, especially since I am approaching campus but uh, basically just wanted to give you guys a brief uh, description of the history of atoms and uh, you know if this is a topic you're interested in uh, go further re research it uh, I encourage you to go google history of the atom uh, there's a lot of useful links out there Wikipedia is in a bad place to start of course um, if you really want to find uh, some real quality knowledge uh, you probably want to expand your search from there but it's not a bad place to start um, probably as always if I uh, ever say anything incorrectly uh, about the history of anything or something scientifically wrong in one of these videos I apologize in advance um, working from memory on the back of my motorcycle so that's uh, what I've got for you hope you enjoyed it and I will talk to you uh, soon let me know uh, what other topics you might want me to uh, discuss from the back of my bike and I will uh, consider doing videos on those talk to you later